Okay, let's start. Um, <coughs> so you're doing speciation more in, more in depth. Okay, obviously these aren't real, right? Um, but it's a good idea of hybridization. Okay, so learning outcomes for today. What do you want you to learn? We want to learn a little bit about hybridization processes involved. We want to learn what reinforcement is. We want to learn about self incompatibility and diversity and also cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay, so lots of jargon, but it's actually not that bad. So first, a question. So will hybridization lead to unfit offspring? And so this is one of those questions that's two points for any answer, so just tell me what you think, not what you think I want you to say. Forty-one. Yeah. Forty-one from Macro Macroevolution Fund. Mnemonic. Okay, one more minute. So almost all of you said D, which in biology is always a safe answer. It's always, you know, it's never like always this or always that. It's always like, yeah, sometimes. So it's correct. <laughs> we'll talk about why. So last time we talked about hybridization as sort of so oftentimes a bad thing for species, right? So here are all these messed up frogs, right? They come from a hybridization event between two very closely related species. Right? Some of the tadpoles are really shaped, some of the tadpoles never turn into adults. Okay, so often you know very bad if, if you so if you make something from different species in that case, you also want to do as well. Okay, so that you've selected against. All right. Let's look at this case. So helianthus. Who knows what helianthus is? Sunflowers, right? Okay. So <coughs> here we have a phylogenetic tree of sunflowers, and we see these are hybrids formed from those two parent species. Okay? Do they do well in nature? What would be your first guess going into this? Okay. Ah, what do you think? Who thinks yes? Okay, why do you think yes? They're hybrids. Okay, very right, simple. So, 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 okay. so, hybrid vigor. The idea that hybrids grow taller, and so this is used in agricultural crops. They'll have seeds that are product of one parental strain and a parental strain, and the offspring will grow well. And whether their grandchildren will grow well, you don't care because you cut them down and eat them. Right? And it's often good for the companies to have you know to keep buying the two seed groups rather than you know, self seed. Good. Also, the fact that people bo bothered naming them is an indication, right? So we didn't name all the freakish little tadpoles. Right, because mm -hmm. they're going to have to persist, persist one generation and die off. Right, but it's definitely worth some some taxonomist time to bother naming these things. It's probably out there in nature somehow. Okay. <coughs> and <coughs> here we see a map showing the parent species, the larix, right, and annulus, okay. and then these little hybrids. And they can occur in places where the parents don't. 
Right, so how could that, what, what could be going on here? Well, there's something called transgressive segregation, we think. Okay. Which sounds like a weird thing. No, that's not what it was doing. Alright, so, I think about something for like genes for plant height. Right? This means you might have a bunch of ones for positive height and for negative height, right? So it's fairly tall, three pluses. Here's a little less tall and two pluses. Okay? Then they have offspring. Now, some of my chance can have all pluses, all minuses, and in between. Does that make sense? Okay. And so what happens is you can have a lot more range in the offspring. Okay. Evolution likes variation, eats it up. Okay. And what we have here it could be that you know the only adaptive phenotype is this sort of height, right? So all these are freaks and go extinct. Okay. But it could be that this is in the habitat where being tall is great. Okay. Lots of tall weeds. This is a habitat that is populated by humans with lawnmowers. Okay. And so the short is adapted. And so <coughs> it could be that this would be variation allowed to go to areas where you're not going to go. Okay. This sort of shows a broad principle of evolution, too. So you have all this variation being generated. Some of it might be adaptive, some of it might not be adaptive, right? That's what natural selection acts on. Okay. Same thing with mutations, right? So mutations cause cancer. So mutations cause nothing, so mutations cause adaptive benefit. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it happened to happen on a good environment where, like, you know, the hybrids are best adapted to living in sand dunes or desert. Mm -hmm. right. And it might not be of height genes, of course, it could be genes for water retention. Give you genes for how much chlorophyll, how many, how many chloroplasts you have in the leaves. Okay. Um, <coughs> any other questions about this? <coughs> actually, someone raised a good question about whether this happens more in plants than animals. Um, actually, that's something I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if it is known. We think sort of like research products. We're thinking about like your proposals at the end of the semester for you know a research talk. Maybe figuring out the proportion of hybridization events that are successful in plants might be, make, you know, might be, might make more sense to animals. What could be a wrinkle in doing something like that? What could get harder to figure that out? Mm -hmm. That's a bias sampling. Right? So maybe it's easier to look at hybrid plants. Maybe we want to look at hybrid plants for agriculture. And so there's a lot more sampling of hybrid plants for agriculture. What's going to be a problem? Say again? Mm -hmm. Right? So it's like the dolphins with the sailors, you know, you know, the ones that are being pushed ashore, the ones that are pushed the other way. Um, so you only see the successful hybrids. What else? What do you need to have to have hybridization happen? Two different species, right? So many number of species matters. What else do you need? Compatibility, right? And so they need to be able to mate, right? And so it's part of compatibility. And so it could be that, you know, plants. So you know, you get pollen floating around, or be the wrong flower, and there's pollen there, and then it can potentially grow down. Whereas animals mating, they have to have all the right mating cues. Right? And so maybe it's easier, you know, if you have the wrong the wrong pollen going to the wrong sunflower, yeah, apparently the flower is fine. If you're the wrong spider going to mate, mate with the wrong female, then you're dead. So it could be that it's easier to have attempted hybridizations in, in, in plants and animals, too. Good. Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> so here is an actual example of potential hybridization in flies. Okay, I won't have you read this. We can check the slides out later online and look at it. <coughs> okay. And so here we have different fly species. <coughs> we have um, potential hybrid plants. 
where you know, they have some genes that are less different from some parents and these are the other Okay. And so it's evidence for potential gene flow in these flies. Okay. Um, and so here's I'm just showing you a potential example of hybridization in animals. Okay. Um, <coughs> here's another example of um, hybrids doing well. Okay. Um, so here we're looking at local adaptation too. So here we have one part of the species is black, one is white, and then we get this gradient. Um, it's a mixture of something like white people and one black. Okay. And so we have this um, <coughs> distribution. What might lead to this distribution? Question. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, just in, in general, um, when we look at the gaming sites, we have a population. Okay. Why doesn't this all become one population? Hmm? Very good. So there's two, possi two, two possibilities, right? One is that, you know, if they were merging, it doesn't have an instant. So we're looking at a snapshot in time, and at some point, they're merging one. Or it could be there's selection act. Or the subject being the white genotype right here, the black genotype right here. And after selection. Okay. <coughs> we'll be able to figure this out. Mm -hmm. All right, so we sample over time and see if we see, for example, more than black people moving north, or we moving south. What else could we do? And so what these science done is look more closely at More similar in what way? So, yeah, so, so I mean, the height sort of shows similarity, right? How about the length of the slope?
Right. So Hidden Central Intelligence we know have been stable for a long time. So some fire belly codes in Europe that have a stable tension zone. And so how do these zones suggest a strong selection? Right? Because if they were, were more gradual, but that you know you would be filtering that we could be sitting there for a while. Right? Probably have this very tight boundary between the floor. And about eight kilometers we go from favor to favor next. But you know, what could be possible is that we're having a disaster sweep and have either those sweeping through or the other way. In fact, we think it's just a stable tension. But you're right, there's no possibility. Any questions about that? Uh, it's a zone where we think there's different selection on um, well, one parental species versus the other parental species. This area where the hybrids are, are being produced in contact between these two different parental species. And so the width, the width of that tells you something about the strength of selection. Yeah, good question. Other questions? Okay, so a torture device for flies. So, we put the flies here, and they attach, and they and go up and go up and go away. And we have different cues in the business. So, we have different kinds of smells you can attach to tubes. This is covered in tape, so it's dark. Up and, down. Um, <coughs> and so, the individual fly, it can choose where it wants to spend its life. It can go towards the sun, up, it can go towards the darkness, down, it can go towards the sun, up, 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 it can go Happen, or they would take all the flies from say here to here, have them mate, and that's it. Okay. So flies that you know were intermediates wouldn't get selected. So you add, add a very strong descriptive selection, but on you know three traits at once. Okay. <coughs> and so it just explains the experiment in more detail. Um, okay. and this just shows the uh, frequency of different flat fly morphs, and we see the difference um, in sort of association of eye color with eye color. So if there's no structural selection, no sort of mating, you can see you know, dark between brown eyes and also red, right? Each other. What they found was that if they have um, strong selection for competing habitats, we start seeing these divergence. And so, when they go up, have brown eyes and go down, have white eyes. So, these genes are linked to uh, associated with, with the other genes. Okay? <coughs> and so, this shows the possibility of disruptive selection okay, leading to different species. Now, does it mean it happens in the wild? No. Why? Mm -hmm. Yep. The wild doesn't have just, you know, eight discrete bins. There's a lot of slop in the wild. And you could have, and we think that, you know, having just one migrant per generation allowed prevents things from, from diverging much in gene flow. Do, 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 uh, diverging much because just because of that gene flow. And so if you have a few individuals hopping across, it would be disruptive. Yeah? No, no, it's, it's, this is a percent of brown-eyed flies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so in um, it's yellow-eyed flies, so you can have that one goes up one. Okay. 
Other questions? And the advantage of doing this rather than just doing, I mean, so you could also do this with theory, too. The advantage of this is if there's something um, that is, you know, controlled but still real life, there might be some other factors that come up that you, don't, you know, didn't expect to see. Right? But you can see if, you know, some sort of attractions or something like that. Okay. Um, Self-incompatibility. Right? So, this shows some of the mechanisms for preventing polymetry growth. And <coughs> if it recognizes itself, it recognizes its own allele in the style, RNA seems to show the RNA and it pops growth. This is one mechanism for keeping self in. Keeping from self in. Okay. Why might you want to prevent self in to the last time? Why? Yep. So we'll get to the back because we talk about why have sex. Um, but by selfing, you have only variation you generate from mutation. Whereas by outcrossing, you have variation from you know, another plant and different a different individual that has different alleles than you do, and so your offspring have a range. So like the transgressive segregation, right? But on a smaller scale. And so there might be selection against having self. -in. But some plants do self, yeah. There are some, I don't know them well. Yeah, yeah. It's not about it's often, but in general, so I mean it's a good question because like did, so you're asking about the specific cases, like for you know, ecologically is the self good for this plant. But in general case you can do an analysis to get at that. And so, <coughs> um, this is a very basic model. We're going to have to talk about this more in five days, I think. Um, where we have two states, in this case, self-compatible and self-compatible. Um, and plus, it has no of the So, there's a Initiation rate for each state, there's an extinction rate for each state, and there's a transition rate. Okay. Um, and this whole sort of half of the is very difficult in the states. And we're very cool that the only way we look at only transition rates for the states, or only at initiation rates, but we get the problem of combination rate. That's a basic model. So how does that actually play out in real life? So here I wrote a simulation to show it. So here we have self-compatible ones, okay, the in that state, and periodically we all self-compatible. And so we see the interplay of speciation, extinction, and transition rates. They have them all together. Yeah. So here we go just talk about it. Does the model make sense? No? Okay, I have questions. Yeah. Uh, self compatible. So in this particular scenario, um, we think we only evolve from that. We only lose uh, and we test that by fitting the models. So we talk, we talk about fitting the models for geography, maybe one species in multiple populations. We put models here and say, given our data, what's more likely? How are the data more likely? We want to do a good model model by 
minimum loss rates or only loss rates? Um, all right, who knows what likelihood is? Okay, let's explain it. Yeah. Right. So likelihood is the problem of the data. Right. So if I had coin flipping, and I said I had heads, heads, tails, what's the probability of that data if I had only heads? If I had a coin that only flipped heads? Zero, right? What if I had a coin that flipped 50 50 heads and tails? It's probably of those data. What's the chance of getting heads for one flip? How about for this flip? Heads for one flip. Right? The probability of those data be one eighth. Right? It's probably getting exactly the string given a fair coin of one eighth. What if we're a coin that was, um, what about a coin that was uh, two thirds heads for the probability of the data be? So the probability of getting heads there, two thirds. Here, two thirds. Here. Which is bigger? Everyone agree? All right. So these data suggest the parameter for the probability of heads is two thirds, not one half. All right. So we fit the we fit the fit the parameters to these data and find out the optimal parameter value under likelihood is two thirds heads. All right. Now of course we, you know, don't think the coins actually the coins are usually this unfair. We have, and so we can talk about how you bring that other information into it later. But right now, just using just likelihood alone, we think this is the estimate for heads using this data. Okay. And the same thing with this sort of model. It's more complex. Here we have a phylogeny in tip data. We can try the parameters to find what value parameter tip heads. And it could be that we have, in this case, we have a zero rate for any Okay. Questions? Other questions? That's good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry, so each dot is an individual species. It could speciate, go extinct, or change color. It could speciate, change two, go extinct, go to one, and keep the same. So I'm going to say, my species, and it's also a change state. And now she can then go extinct, in which case you fall down, and she can speciate, and have another female. So it's none of me, right, but I can't stand my her. And so then when then, you then go extinct, or speciate, you change state. And so <coughs> we can estimate all the ways in which that happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
incompatible self. In this in this particular model. And so <coughs> what these authors did was use this basic model and estimate the self-compatible species <coughs> rate and execution. And self-compatible species rate. Why might you do that? We'll talk about this more in three days, but why is that difference interesting? Okay, so population growth. So Japan's population, oh, Russia's population is decreasing. The U.S.'s population is increasing. Right? Does that mean everyone in Japan is dying and not having kids? No. Maybe in the U.S. is it immortal in having kids? No. What does it mean? More births than deaths. Right. Okay. Same thing for species. Right. So this difference in speciation rate and extinction rate is births minus deaths for species. Okay. <coughs> so here we see the rate estimates we have some uncertainty. It's about the Asian thing. Right now, we're looking at this as our sort of credibility for how much people are approval of the company. Paper zero is. What does it tell us about some kind of diversification? How did we enter? Zero. What does that mean? Yep, what? Right. So the number of species that are self incompatible will keep growing through time. Right? What about self compatible? The orange line is zero. Mm -hmm. Right. So they have more death than births. Why didn't you left? The lifetime, right? So if you start off with population age, let's say go off and all the other drugs, then it's one possibility. Yeah. What else? Yep. Yep. We have this pollution rate, right? So we have mutation for this state, and we go this thing. Good question. So, and that mutation is lower here. Why do you left your purple one because you time? Exactly. So time scales are very different. We can evolve self compatibility in a very short time scale. And like, yes, in the long run, you'll go extinct, but you don't know that when you do it. Right? It's just that you accept the poison. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Or it could be you know, the other one. Sometimes for some traits, you not this trait, you also need the mutation for it, too. And so, mutation can be a good thing. Good question. Yeah. Same thing as with cancer. Not adaptive for your cells to, to have cancer and kill you, right? But it keeps occurring. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I don't know. And I mean, a study like this, um, people just dichotomize it because it's easier to deal with. So we had a, if we had a mixed state that had you know, a whole set of pollution stuff. Yeah. No, that'd be 
profit now because it's been <coughs> in one state or another state. Mm -hmm. um, even if there's a thin population, the currency reflects it. Some of it's itself, and some of it's itself. So it's still a little bit different model that it's still in what they have in the mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there are more complex models in Delta than Phoenix, but not itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this is something where in the joint skeptical studies, how do they deal with this sort of thing? We can start looking at evolution of woodiness, right? Well, everyone knows what a wood, woody thing is, right? Well, see a tree, okay, it's woody, right? What about a palm tree? It's not really true wood, okay? What about something that has a, a wooden stem that's like this tall, right? Well, always, you know, times you start getting to like, discretizing the same traits like this, it's a problem, right? It's like, okay, well, our rule is X. And see if people agree with it. Yeah. What you could also try to do is try separate rules. You say, okay, let's try it once where if you're mixed, if you're listed, you're showing it together, if you're mixed, you're listed. You get some answer out. If you do, you have to bust it. If it changes, you make trouble. Questions about that? Okay. So, the big message here for this, this, this class is that self compatibility is stuck against in the long term. Okay. So Haldane's rule. So look at this table of numbers. <coughs> what, what can you derive? What inference can you derive from this? Why don't we talk, break into groups and talk in groups for a couple minutes about this? Okay, so talk to your neighbors. Is these sort of what patterns you see and so you can figure out any possible explanations. Okay, so people think. Any, any, any hypotheses? Thank you. 
And we know anything about the breeding systems of those, or the genetic systems of those different groups? What's the determination in uh, humans? The difference whether you're male or female? X and Y, right. right. So XX is female, XY is male. It's not all the same system. What do you, know, you guess about birds and, butter, birds and butterflies? It's reversed. So in birds and butterflies, the heterogamic sex is females. And the homogamic sex is males. Okay. So knowing that, what do you think? Y or ZW, you lose versus one group of sex. Why might that matter for hybrids? Why, why might that <coughs> evolve for hybrid, hybrids? I'm not sure about that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But why, why wouldn't the one from the other species just take over? <clears throat> exactly. Yep, perfect. So if you are... Um, If we have, you know, a female in, in say, Psophila, right, and this copy is missing a certain gene, and some other, some other, some other chromosome, whatever, well, we still have the copy from the other species, right? But if we have, right, um, then if it's missing, you know, if this copy is missing, right, why does it have it? So you're out of luck. Okay. And so one thought is that what causes um, all the rule is due to, you know, sexual genes are sort of present only in only one copy in, say, males in software males. Yeah. It's just an observation. So it's just an observation. Yep. Yeah. In the case of, you know, inviability or infertility, Generally, the heterogeneous sex. That's how they rule. Yeah, so a lot of times in macroevolution we have these rules, and rules means something we see a lot of the time. Right? Do we see it all the time? Sort of, sort of thing. Same thing with Cope's rule, things tend to get bigger. Yeah, okay. Ribbon's rule, things get cuter as they go towards extremes, smaller ears and stuff. Yeah. Um, it, these are exceptions, right? But, these all code rules. <coughs> Questions about this? Okay, okay cytoplasmic incompatibility. So this is interesting both for thinking about DMIs but also thinking about uh, selection. Yeah. Much more closely related to each other. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's a good, good, it's a good question. So we know that um, in many reptile groups, they use temperature, temperature determined sex determination. So it could be that, so we think of the phylogeny. Right. 
So we have mammals here, we have birds here, we have crocodiles here, we have snakes and lizards, we have turtles, right? And we know that these have temperature determined sex, these have temperature determined sex. I'm not sure about lizards and snakes, I don't know. Okay, yeah. So it suggests that the ancestor here had temperature determined sex, right? Up in here, we don't know, right? Um, <coughs> but it certainly seems that, you know, regardless of whether this was was gene determined or sex determined, at least the ancestor of birds, they went through a case where they were, where they were temperature determined. And then they re evolved sex chromosomes. And then by chance, they evolved the other way. So it's the ZW rather than the XY system. So if it's, if it's warm, you make more females. If it's cold, you make more males. Yeah. And so, like, you know, alligators have like maternal care of their of their eggs, and so like carefully regulate how much stuff is on top of their nest to keep the temperature warm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a very, very good question there. And actually, even in mammals, the what the sex chromosome is keeps evolving, and so uh, the, the the Y has re-evolved. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see how the thinking phylogenetically can help. So I said, oh, that's what we evolved it. Okay. <coughs> All right. So, Wolbachia well, interesting. Well, we have very little time. Wolbachia well, interesting because of <coughs> DMIs, which are much like DMIs, but also because of we're thinking about what, things, what selection pressures are on. Okay. So, if your male has been infected with Wolbachia and your female does not, Together with it, you have no offspring. If you're female without, you have no offspring. Yes, but no. That's this pattern we see. Right? Um, and, you know, I'll get to the punchline. The reason that this evolves is because <coughs> if you're a female who will back to you, you're often will back if these two are have offspring, they're often going to be the same as And so for the Lobachia, if <coughs> males are mating with other females, right, then the mixed population has some way to say about Lobachia. The females with the Lobachia will have no offspring. The males without Lobachia will have no offspring with the mating with the Lobachia. That's what stop that it gives some. Evolved because it gives some selective pressure. This mechanism has evolved because it gives some pressure for the lack of pressure. However, the initial case where the population is just, you know, minus time as in the first of the end, essentially gets you. And so you have to get a certain threshold to have, to have it take off in this way. So the cool thing for this class is it sort of functions, it can function to. to lead to speciation, I think, right? <coughs> and so here is our agency mode compatibilities, right? So I evolve separately, you know, one, one, mm -hmm. one, you know, see each other in the future, and you come back, come back, and then you come back, right? Now there's a back here, so this one is a back here, and this one is a back here, B. They don't recognize each other. So to a lucky A, if you have a lucky B, it's like you don't have a lucky at all. <coughs> and so males from here won't have the lucky with males from here. Males from here won't have the lucky with males from here. And so it leads to a few of isolation just through this infection rather than to any other genetic trait. Does that make sense? So it's one potential mechanism for having speciation driven by this bacteria. And Wolbachia in general are really cool. So another thing you do, if you're only passed on to females, it's to your, your evolutionary advantage to have only female offspring. Right? So you can actually convert males to females in some species. We can kill off uh, male offspring in some species. Um, so you have these, you know, you want to get the selection pressure, you create the thing. Right? So you pass on to females, you can evolve. Know, or 
And why cytoplasmic compatibility? Well, we'll you know, transmitted cytoplasm. All right, any questions? Okay. Next time, the dark side, extinction.